Hello everyone. So today we are going to be talking about the hemodynamic calculations that we can actually obtain using uh, transesophageal echocardiography. Um, this is part of the lectures for the Toronto General Hospital uh, Cardiac Fellows as a preparation for the PT advanced uh, exam of the National Board of uh, Echocardiography. So let's just start. Uh, I don't have any disclosures to discuss with you. Um, as you well know, there is no academic or financial or any kind of compensation received uh, for giving this talk. The objective uh, for the talk that we are um, talking today is going to uh, make a little assessment of uh, what can we do with uh, Doppler equation, Bernoulli equation, how to uh, get all or the most common intracardiac pressures using uh, TE, uh, the continuity equation, uh, how to assess intracardiac tunes, uh, DPDT, what it is, what do we use it for, and we're going to talk a little bit of uh, systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance. So I thought uh, interesting to get this little table um, so you guys can have like a little uh, preparation for your exam. There is a summary of uh, almost uh, every single calculation that you can actually uh, think about. Those are the most uh, frequent uh, kind of calculations that you're going to be using when you are doing a study uh, in TE and you can actually use it uh, as a summary at the very end. Okay, some of the formulas are not recommended by the American Society of Echo guidelines. Some of them are actually extracted from uh, different papers where they find like really uh, good sensitivity and specificity when they are used. So let's just begin with the hard material. So to start with, uh, we are going to be talking about the Doppler equation. Remember, the Doppler equation is just like a, a representation of the Doppler effect. And when the Doppler effect, uh, uh, when, when the source and the receiver are in motion relative to each other, this Doppler effect is presented as a Doppler shift, which is what we are seeing uh, as the first part of the equation. Okay? Um, so when um, the, the, the sound that is emitted uh, moves towards the transducer, so this is going to be a positive uh, effect. And then when the when the the wavelength is actually moving away from the transducer, we are going to call this uh, negative. Okay. So the blood flow, which is which means that the blood flow which is moving towards the transducer produces a positive Doppler shift signal, and conversely, the blood flow that is moving away from the transducer produces a negative Doppler shift signal. So it's important from the Doppler equation that you remember what's, what is FR, which is the reflected frequency, which is FT, which is the transmitted frequency, and this is going to be given by the transducer. Uh, the number 2 represents a constant and it reflects the signal of moving to a target and coming back. V is going to be the velocity of the blood in meters per second. Cosine of the angle is the angle of isonation. So with that, uh, the maximum recommended angle where you're assessing a signal is 25 degrees. And what's that? Because the cosine of 25 is 0.9. The cosine of actually, uh, of actually 0 degrees is 1, which means like a perfect... Uh, signal back. So ideally you are looking for zero angle when you are measuring a signal by the Doppler equation, but up to 25 degrees is acceptable because the cosine of 25 is going to be 0.9. The moment that you start to actually increase, if you go to 90 degrees, you are not going to be able to get any Doppler signal back because the cosine of 90 is going to be zero. So the equation is completely worthless. Okay. And finally, um, all this equation is divided by C, which represents the speed of sound in soft tissue. So the most common way of actually represent that is 1.54 meters per second, but it, it can actually be called uh, 1540 meters per second to the minus 1. So 
to pick going, you probably are more familiar with uh, how to calculate pressure gradients. And to calculate the pressure gradients by TEE, you are going to need the Bernoulli equation. We tend to simplify this equation, but really the Bernoulli equation, uh, it's just like a, a pressure gradient that is calculated from the velocity using that equation. Okay, so what is going to be compound of the Bernoulli equation is going to be the convective acceleration, that is the one that we are going to be able to change for parameter wise, the flow acceleration and the viscous friction. Both the flow acceleration and the viscous friction are going to be considered negligible for the equation because we are con going to consider them equal in all the in, all the, in almost all the circumstances. And we will talk about which ones are the exceptions for that, okay? It's important to differentiate when we are actually talking about the Bernoulli equation, um, that the difference in one point towards another is reflected by four per b to the square, which is what we got. So, from these formulas and having in account what I just mentioned, you're going to have to simplify Bernoulli equation, which is your well-known, uh, the difference in, in pressure is going to be measured by, the, the pressure gradients are going to be measured by four per V to the square. And this is going to give you, based on your max velocity, your peak gradient from the V max. But there is an exception to that. You can actually not use the simplified Bernoulli equation and it's recommended to use the modified Bernoulli equation in two circumstances. The first one is when your B max is low, which means less than three meters per second, and your B proximal is actually high, more than 1.5 meters per second, high enough to have an impact in the gradients. So when the velocity is one meter per second, the V prox, the velocity prox, the proximal velocity is below one meters per second, that gives you almost nothing because it's four per one to the square, which is four millimeters of mercury. So anything below one is actually going to give you a negligible number. But if it's more than 1.5, or even if the V max is small, this will have an impact on your pressure gradient. So then is when you guys need to use the Bernoulli equation. It's important to realize that the Bernoulli equation is not the one that is going to give you the mean gradients when we are assessing, for example, an aortic stenosis. So the mean gradients, those are an average of the instantaneous mean gradients over the ejection period. And this is calculated by the software of the machine by the velocity time integral, or the VTI. Or to get an approximation, you can do 2.4 per Vmax to the square and that will give you like an indirect measurement of what's the mean gradient. Okay, so we have been talking about the Bernoulli equation. So how do we calculate intracardiac pressures then? So the first thing that you need to remember is that the velocity of a regurgitant jet is directly related to the pressure drop across a valve and using that you can determine any intracardiac pressure so the difference in pressure from one point to the other equals the pressure gradient which equals the Bernoulli equation which is 4v to the square so I'm going to ask you to follow three simple rules if you can remember those three rules, you will not need to remember any formula or memorize any formula. You will be able to deduct the formula from the three rules that I'm going to show you now. So, to start with, identify which is the regurgitant jet and if it's on the right or, left, or the left side of the heart. So, if it's on the right or the left, the time of the regurgitant jet is going to be different. And to understand that means if you are having on the right side of the heart a regurgitant jet during systole, this is going to be your tricuspid regurgitation. If you are having a diastolic regurgitant, regurgitant jet from the left side of the heart, then we are going to talk about our regurgitation. Same thing for MR and PR. 
So you need to realize if it's on the right side of the heart, the pressure that they are asking you, or if it's on the left side of the heart. And you need to realize if the pressure that they are asking you is during systole or during diastole. And based on that, you're going to know from which regurgitant jet you're going to be able to obtain the formula. Okay? And the last of the things, when you know if it's from a right pressure or a left pressure, the one that you are, they are asking you a systolic or a diastolic pressure, you need to identify between which two areas the pressure difference is occurring. That's very simple. You only need to flow the regurgitant flow. So from chamber A to chamber B where the regurgitant jet goes, which is the different in pressure gradients, okay? So let's just practice a little bit that. Okay, so you have the right ventricular pressure. So you want to know, for example, the RBSPs, or the right ventricular systolic pressure. We are talking about a pressure on the right side of the heart during systole, which is the regurgitant jet that happens to, on the right side of the heart during systole, dicaspid regurgitation, yes. So, and the flow goes from the right ventricle to the right atrium. When? In systole. So the right ventricular systolic pressure during systole and the right atrial pressure during systole. So if you take that, your RBSPs or right ventricular systolic pressure are going to equal the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Okay, and on the right atrium, the pressure during systole is going to be your right atrial pressure or CVP. There is an exception to that. The right ventricular systolic pressure is not only going to equal the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. If there is pulmonary stenosis, you need to subtract the pulmonary stenosis gradient between the right ventricle and the PA. Otherwise, the formula is not going to be accurate. Just have that in mind, okay? So based on that, we apply the Bernoulli equation, and then what we got is that the pressure gradients equal 4V to the square. In this case, we mentioned that the regurgitant jet that we're going to use to get the RBSPs is going to be the TR. So pressure in the right ventricle, RBSPs, minus pressure in the right atrium, right atrial pressure, or CVP, equals 4V to the square, being the velocity from the TR. So RBSPs or pulmonary artery systolic pressure, this is going to equal 4 for the velocity of the TR to the square plus the right atrial pressure. And as you well know, you will localize your modify by K value in T, get the TR, get do a continuous with Doppler from this modify by K1, get the, get the maximum velocity on the TR square it, multiply per 4, and add the right atrial pressure, and you will instantaneously get the right ventricle systolic pressure. You need to remember one thing. What is going to happen when you have tricuspid regurgitation and you have a PDA or a BSD? We will talk about that later on the lecture, but just remember that, okay? Because then the things are going to be different. And remember, this RBSP is not going to be reliable with RV failure, RV infarction, and RV obstruction, okay? Those three conditions are not going to validate this formula. Just have it in the back of your mind. So we have been talking about right ventricular pressure. What about pulmonary artery pressures? Okay, so let's see that we want to know a pulmonary artery mean pressure or a pulmonary and diastolic pressure. So if you want to know that, we are talking about a right-sided pressure that happens in diastole. So which is the regurgitant jet that happens in diastole in the right side of the heart? Pulmonary regurgitation. So we are going to use the pulmonary regurgitation flow. And the flow goes from the PA to the RV. So the pressure in the pulmonary artery during diastole can be the pulmonary artery mean pressure or the pulmonary artery and diastolic uh, pressure. 
and the pressure in the right ventricle during diastole during diastole means that the tricuspid is open so the rvdp is going to equal the right atrial pressure because the tricuspid is open and is communicated with the right atrium so we can assume the rv rvdp is going to be your cvp at that time okay so using the formula we start again from the PA, pulmonary artery pressure during diastole minus the RVDP, which is the right atrial pressure, will equal 4 per V to the square in this velocity from the PR jet. So from all this, if you want to calculate the pulmonary artery mean pressure, what you're going to get is 4 per V to the square, being because it's the mean pressure, the PR peak velocity as you can see in the lower part of the screen on the right side, the PR peak pressure. When you regurgitant, you get that, and automatically you will get the mean uh, PA pressure, okay? And you need to add to that the right atrial pressure. Another way of determining the pulmonary artery mean pressure is another formula that we normally is not related to the Bernoulli indication, which is a third of pulmonary systolic pressure plus two thirds of the pulmonary artery diastolic pressures, which is another common formula known for that. Okay, so if we want to go and determine what's the PA and diastolic pressure, it's exactly the same formula that we were using. It's four per the PR, but it's an end diastolic velocity, which you will measure as you can see in the right side part of the screen in the lower part of the screen no? the pr and diastolic velocity over there you will take this one as your pr and diastolic velocity you will square that multiply per four and add the right atrial pressure and that will give you the pulmonary uh, artery and diastolic pressure so what other formulas can we use there are other articles that talk about the mean difference in pressure between the right ventricle and the right atrium plus the right atrial pressure and the other formula that is uh, commonly used in other articles is 79 minus 0.45 per rbot acceleration time but those are formulas that you need to memorize if you want to remember you can always go to the articles and go back to them and get the formulas but if you want to use your Bernoulli equation, using the equations that we just mentioned, you're going to be able to perform. So we have talked about RBSPs, we have talked about uh, diastolic PA pressures. What about left atrial pressure? Okay, so this is the left atrial pressure is on the left side of the heart this time. Uh, during systole, the regurgitant jet that happens, because we're doing systole is when the mitral valve is supposed to be closed and then the left, left atrial pressure is going to be fully in it so on the left side of the heart during systole the regurgitant jet that happens is mitral regurgitation and the flow in mitral regurgitation goes from the left ventricle to the left atrium so during systole the left ventricular pressure during systole is going to equal your systolic blood pressure and the left atrial pressure during systole is the one that we are going to want to calculate. So based on the Bernoulli equation, again, you have left ventricle systolic pressure or systolic blood pressure minus the left atrial pressure is going to equal 4 per B to the regurgitant jet, which in this case is the MR to the square. So that gives you left atrial pressure equals systolic blood pressure minus 4 per the velocity of the MR to the square. Okay, so this is a classical formula. They love to ask this kind of uh, formula in the exam. So if you need to calculate, that's how you will actually do it. So other formulas that have been used for calculate the left atrial pressure that are well known is E from the mitral inflow by push with Doppler at the tip of the mitral leaflet divided by the E prime by tissue Doppler plus four or 
the other one not as well known of uh, 1.24 per e divided by the e prime plus 1.9 but again those are formulas that you can actually have in your little you can actually put in your pocket when you are doing the calculations but they are not going to be using the Bernoulli equation to actually detect them so an important part when you are measuring left lateral pressures is like this is going to be invalid when you have an LVOT obstruction, a PFO, or an ASD. And we will talk a little bit about those uh, further on the lecture. Okay, so left lateral pressure, left ventricular pressure. So if you want to calculate the left ventricular pressure, okay, so you are talking about the left side of the heart during diastole. Okay, the left ventricular pressure during diastole, okay, this is the, the, the regurgitating jet that is going to happen on the left side of the heart during diastole is aortic regurgitation. And in aortic regurgitation, the flow goes from the aorta into the left ventricle. So you have flow from the aorta during diastole is the aortic diastolic pressure, also known as diastolic blood pressure and the left ventricle pressure during diastole is the LVEVP, which is the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So based on those two pressures, again we get diastolic blood pressure minus the left ventricular and diastolic pressure equals four per the velocity of the arteriogitant jet at end diastole, because the left ventricle and diastolic pressure is at end diastole. So as you can see here, on the right side of the screen, at the very bottom, the AR and diastolic pressure should be measured exactly where the white arrow is indicating. And this will give you the left ventricular and diastolic pressure equals the diastolic blood pressure that will be given uh, to you minus four per the velocity at end diastole of the AR jet to the square. So what happens if we have severe and massive artery regurgitation? So you should assume when that happens that the left ventricular and diastolic pressure equals the diastolic blood pressure. Okay, this is another exception when we are applying these formulas. So we have talk of the four most common intracardiac pressures that you may be asked for. So continuing on, we are going to talk about the flow by continuity equation. This is something that you are very familiar with from when we assess aortic stenosis again. And the continuity equation is only showing that flow equals area per velocity, which means that the stroke volume equals area per, in this case, the VTI, which uh, with the stroke volume, we can actually calculate the cardiac output being stroke volume by heart rate. Okay, so when you get stroke volume and we talk about area, we are talking, assuming that the surface is a circle, the cross-sectional area of something, the perimeter, is going to be the pi per radius to the square. And it's going to give you centimeters to the square. Multiply per the velocity time integral of the VTI, which is given in centimeters, which is the stroke distance, this will give you a stroke volume in centimeters to the cube or milliliters. Okay, so stroke volumes in the aortic valve equals a stroke volume in the LVOT. So aortic valve area per VTI of the aortic valve, of the aortic valve will equal cross-section area of the LVOT per VTI of the LVOT which is the classical formula that we use to calculate the aortic valve area, okay? So aortic valve area equals cross-section area of the LVOT, which you will be able to calculate from pi per the radius from the diameter in the LVOT to the square, okay? Per VTI on the LVOT from the tracing of the VTI and then the VTI in the aortic valve, and then you will be able to calculate the aortic valve area. So aortic valve. That's the example that we actually place when we were commenting on the continuity equation. When you have stenosis, you need to remember that 
what they are going to ask you is the mean gradient and not the peak gradient. So you will not use the Bernoulli equation to get the mean gradient. The mean gradient is going to be calculated by the machine by the VDI, okay? But you can use the continuity equation to get the RT valve area as per the example that we just uh, comment when we were talking about the continuity equation. But what happened, we want to actually uh, quantify regurgitation. So when you want to quantify regurgitation, there are a couple of methods that you can use, the volumetric and the PISA method. When we are talking about the volumetric measure, so we are going to base everything on the regurgitant volume, regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction. So in case of aortic regurgitation, the regurgitant volume and in any kind of other regurgitation is always going to be equal to the stroke volume of the regurgitant valve minus the stroke volume of the referent valve. In this case, the stroke volume of the regurgitant valve is going to be the stroke volume of the aortic valve or stroke volume of the LVOT, okay? So this is going to be calculated by cross-section area of the LVOT per LVOT VTI. And the stroke volume in the reference valve, the valve that is normally used is the mitral valve, if the mitral valve has no regurgitation or stenosis. And this is going to be calculated by the cross-section area of the mitral valve per the mitral valve VTI. So, you all know how to calculate the stroke volume in the LVOT, which is going to be diameter of the LVOT and BTI of the LVOT. And the people is not so familiar in how to get actually the cross sectional area of the mitral valve, uh, but is familiar on how to get the mitral valve VTI. For the cross sectional area of the mitral valve, you will go to the four chamber view, get the annulus of the mitral valve, you will consider that the diameter and pi per radius to the square you will get the cross-section area of the mitral valve and then you will trace the VTI on the mitral valve and you will obtain the stroke volume. So when you do the calculations by volumetry, you are going to get the volume. When you are using the PISA, you are going to actually first start to obtain the regurgitant flow and the regurgitant flow in the PISA method is going to be the surface of at the hemisphere. So you will shift your baseline towards the regurgitant jet, get your two pi per the radius of the piece envelope to the square per the aliasing velocity, which is uh, in T, the top aliasing velocity towards the regurgitant jet. If, um, if we are assessing the, the art regurgitation from the deep transgastric view, and you need to modify that per the angle of the jet, divided by 180. With the regurgitant flow, the next thing that you need to do is to trace the AR jet by continuous with Doppler and automatically you will get the peak velocity from the regurgitant jet in the aortic valve and the VTI of the aortic valve. So the ROA is going to be your regurgitant flow divided by your peak velocity and the regurgitant volume is going to be effective regurgitant orifice area per ARVTI. Finally, the regurgitant fraction is going to be the regurgitant volume that you already obtained divided by the stroke volume of the regurgitant valve. And this is going to give you an estimation on how to calculate insufficiency here, okay? So what are the pitfalls? of uh, the volumetric method. So the push rate Doppler sample volume location. Normally the mitral valve annulus, you need to go at the tip of the mitral leaflets and the same thing with the LVOT. It can actually be a source of error. The other thing is the diameter measurements. So any mistakes that is making on the diameter, if you're not cutting perfectly aligned the diameter, so on the location, on the timing, so the error is going to be a square which is a very important source of errors. If you have arrhythmias, you need to average over several bits. And if you have a multi-valve lesions or shunts, the formulas are invalid. If there is a significant shunt, or if it is more than mild regurgitation of, uh, of the, the non-regurgitant valve. So we have talked about the aortic valve. Let's just talk about the, the mitral valve. Okay, so, 
stenosis. So several formulas are described for mitral valve stenosis. The level one uh, class is uh, mitral valve area uh, being the formula 220 divided by the pressure half time. This formula is invalid if you have AR because the AR is going to actually provoke an early closure of the mitral valve and is going to overestimate, uh, sorry, it's going to underestimate your mitral valve area. Okay, so that's one of the formulas. It's very commonly used. Uh, the graphic that you have on the right side of the screen, uh, where it's pointing the, the white arrow, shows you that you should not do the pressure half time at the very beginning of the mitral valve inflow. And you should wait until the first deflection to actually do the, the measurement and not take that in account. Otherwise, you're going to induce another mistake. If you use the continuity equation, mitral valve area can be calculated as cross section area of the LVOT per VTI of the LVOT divided by the VTI of the mitral valve, exactly as we were doing there with the aortic valve. And there is a third method when you use the PISA method, which is 2 pi per radius per square per the aliasing velocity divided by the peak. This is going to be what is being called the effective regurgitant orifice. And there is a nice illustration on the right side of the screen on how to do that. But this is to be discussed in another lecture. So pitfalls uh, of mitral valve stenosis, remember, when you're using pressure half time, you cannot use it with AR or with diastolic dysfunction. When you're using the continuity equation, you cannot use it with AR or MR, but the continuity equation on the difference of the pressure half time is going to be flow independent. And when you're using PISA, it's flow independent, but it's very difficult and it's very subjectable to errors in measurements. So when we're talking about uh, regurgita regurgitation in mitral valve, again, you can use the bolometric or the PISA method. We already described the PISA method for the our regurgitation. It's exactly the same for the mitral regurgitation. For the volumetric measure on the mitral valve, what you want to have is the regurgitant volume in a mitral regurgitation is going to be the stroke volume of the mitral valve minus the stroke volume of the competent valve, which is the LVOT or the aortic valve. So the stroke volume of the mitral valve can be calculated. How do you calculate that? The recommendation is to do it and diastolic volume minus L and systolic volume in the left ventricle. And this is going to give you the stroke volume in the mitral valve. Okay, and then the regurgitant fraction can be derivated from here. Okay, so we have talked about Bernoulli equation, continuity equation, Doppler effect. We are going to talk a little bit about intracardiac shunts. So, okay, so an intracardiac shunt is measured by the QPQS. What's the QPQS? So it's a pulmonic to systemic stroke volume ratio, which means the stroke volume in the right heart compared to the stroke volume in the left heart. Okay, so how do we measure stroke volume in the right heart? You can use it in the PA or in the RVOT, which can be cross sectional area of the PA per VTI of the PA, cross sectional area of the RVOT per VTI of the RVOT. As you can see in the image on the right side of the screen, the stroke volume in the left side of the heart is the stroke volume in the aortic valve or LVOT. And again, how do you calculate this stroke volume? It's cross sectional area of the LVOT per VTI of the LVOT. BOT or cross sectional area of the aortic valve per VTI of the aortic valve. So, which is important to know when you are measuring intracardiac shunts is knowing uh, where is the, the side distal to the shunt inflow and the side distal to the shunt outflow. When we are talking about an ASD, so the flow goes from the left atrium normally to the right atrium, no? So the distal, the side which is distal to the shunt inflow, because here the shunt inflow is going to be your right atrium. So the side distal to the right atrium is going to be the tricuspid annulus first, then the RVOT, then the main PA. And the side distal to the shunt outflow, which is the left atrium, is going to be the mitral valve annulus, the LVOT, and the ascending aorta. What happens when you're assessing a BSD? Normally, the flow goes from the higher pressure chamber, left ventricle, to the right ventricle. So the side distal to the 
shunt inflow. The shunt inflow is the right ventricle. So distal to that, you're going to have the RVOT, the main PA, or even the mitral valve annulus. And the, 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 distal, the side distal to the shunt outflow, which is the left ventricle, is going to be LVOT, standing aorta, and the cuspid valve annulus. For a PDA, which is the connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, is exactly the same principle. So you understand which side is uh, distal to the shunt inflow and the shunt outflow, you actually can calculate using your Bernoulli equation any kind of pressure in ASDs, BSDs, or PDAs. Let's go with examples. So imagine that you have a BSD. It's going from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, okay? So and they ask you, you have a patient with a BSD that goes at X meters per second, and then I want you to be able to give me your right ventricular systolic pressure. So what are we going to do? So again, Bernoulli equation, different in pressures, four per the velocity of the BSD to the square. What is happening this velocity in systole and is left ventricle to right ventricle. So during systole, the left ventricular pressure, okay, is your systolic blood pressure. During systole, the right ventricular pressure is your RVSPs. So systolic blood pressure minus RVSPs equals 4 per the velocity of the BSD to the square. Then based on that, the RVSPs is going to equal systolic blood pressure minus 4 per the velocity of the BSD to the square. So if in this same question they ask you how do you calculate the right ventricle and diastolic pressure, so we apply the same formula. And again, the same thing. You choose change the timing. Instead of systole, now we are talking about diastole. So the right ventricle and diastolic pressure is going to equal the left ventricle and diastolic pressure minus 4 per the BSD diastolic velocity to the square. What happened with an ISD or a PFO, which is more commonly used? So in a PFO, based on the same Bernoulli equation, so you have the left atrial pressure, okay, is actually going to shunt pressure towards the right atrium. So the different the pressure gradient equals four per the velocity of the PFO to the square, then left atrial pressure as you can see here minus right atrial pressure which is your cvp is going to equal four per the velocity of the pfo to the square which gives you left atrial pressure equals four per the velocity of the pfo to the square plus the right atrial pressure so we don't care how they want to this case that this guy is that if it's a pda it's a PFO, BSD, which is based on your pressure gradient equals 4 per V to the square. You're going to be able to determine any pressure that you want. And that's the matter of the flow goes from the left to the right, or it goes from the right to the left. The only thing that you need to, to change is the subtraction in the order of the flow. Okay, we are arriving at the final of the lecture. I hope you're still there with us. So, DPDT. So DPDT is something that we use a lot for quantifying systolic uh, function and we use it when we have uh, severe regurgitations in the right and the left side of the heart. So the DPDT is the rate of ventricular pressure rise. Okay, so when we start talking about the RV uh, systolic performance, you use DPDT when you have uh, severe TR, for example, because you are assuming that the whole flow on the right ventricle is going forward when you have severe TR, that's definitely not happening because at least 50% is going backwards. So a good way to actually assess systolic function is the way the, the rate of ventricular pressure rise when you are assessing the TR jet from one meter per second to two meters per second, how long it takes to actually rise. The less time it takes, 
in this uh, in this rise okay is is going to be actually a better systolic performance because it's between one and two meters per second the difference between one and two is going to be always difference in pressure is four per v to the square at two meters per second which is the v max minus four per v to the square which is the v prox at one uh, meter per second which means 16 minus 4 so the dp is always going to be 12 and then the dt the time is the, the time the milliseconds that is going to take from going from 2 meters per second from 1 meter per second to 2 meters per second okay so if it's less than 400 that means it's abnormal why? Because it takes it takes a long time to actually be able to generate this regurgitant jet. So the bigger the number is when the millimeters of mercury are going to be higher and the pressure that is able to generate is faster. So based on the same principle, we can assess the LV systolic function when we have severe MR. But in this case, because it's a mitral regurgitation, as the flows are higher than on the right side of the heart, we are talking between the difference between three meters per second on the MR jet and one meter per second on the Mayer MR jet, which makes the difference in pressure 36 minus four is always going to be 32 on the DP. The DT is the time that is going to take the mitral regurgitant jet uh, to reach from one to three. Okay, if it's below 1200, that means it's abnormal. If it's above 1200, that means that it's normal. You need to generate at least 1200 millimeters of mercury per second to be a competent ventricle. If you're not able to do that, it's because the ventricle is dilated. It's not able to generate this MR jet despite having severe MR. Okay. So systemic vascular resistance. And the vascular resistance is just to finish the lectures with. This is based on a, on a not very recent, this is from 2004, but I think it's uh, probably a good way to actually uh, get uh, SBRs when you don't have a swan gans if you are doing a TE study, okay? So when you need to assess systemic vascular resistance, uh, Abbas et al. were able to actually, instead of using the classical swan gans formula of AT per MAP minus mean right lateral pressure divided by the cardiac output, uh, they were able to see that the relationship between the velocity on the MR jet divided by the VTI on the LVOT is able to give you with a decent sensitivity and a specificity if the SBRs are high or not. Okay, the most important part is if this relationship is below 0.2 the sensitivity is almost 92 percent and the specificity is 88 percent to say that you don't have high SBRs and if it's above 0.27 it's highly predictable of having high SBRs applying the same uh, the same principle and that was described by the same author in 2013 the pulmonary vascular resistance can be calculated from instead of the regular uh, PA catheter formula the relationship between the velocity in the TR and the RVOT VTI. Exactly the same principle that we use for the systemic vascular resistance. And what it's telling you is that uh, if this relationship is more than 0.27, exactly almost 30%, so if you have a more than 30% relationship between the velocity in the TR divided by the velocity in the RVOT, that means that is highly suspicious for high pulmonary vascular resistance, okay? So to finish, I wanted to actually um, let you know about other values. CBP can be estimated most of the by the by by the cardiologist. They normally guess how much is the CBP, but there are several several formulas that have been described. This one you obviously can't uh, remember. You need to write it down. It's a little bit more complicated, but it can actually be calculated with the tricuspid valve inflow spool rate doubler on the E wave. And this is described at MERS in 2016 in the current opinion of anesthesiology.
the pulmonary uh, capillary watch pressure exactly from the mid-esophageal four chamber applying this uh, formula that you can see here and based on the mitral valve inflow pulse wave doppler on the e wave and the mitral anulus tissue doppler e prime between the relationship of the two of them you can actually get the pulmonary capillary pressure and the pulmonary vascular resistance that we wish to stock between the relationship that was before the formula that Merce et al. gave for that is showing here on the right side how to get those velocities from the middle of facial four chamber and the transgastric RV and the basal view. So as a conclusion, there is various hemodynamic data that might be obtained with non-invasive uh, Doppler echocardiography. The Doppler der uh, derived hemodynamic data has a great uh, impact on clinical decision making and the derived barriers are time consuming but can definitely be obtained. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture. That's uh, all for today. Um, we will ask you some multi-choice questions uh, on the review session and thank you very much uh, for listening.